Welcome back to our Bible study through the book of Colossians. In this session, we'll be in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 11. And here's how he starts in verse 1. He says, So, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Things Now, so, again, is in reference to what he just talked about in our previous session towards the end, the second half of Colossians chapter 2, where he's essentially saying, uh, again, as we talked about, that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. So certain regulations and pra- spiritual practices are not wrong in and of themselves, that, but they become wrong when we view them as things that we have to do in order for God to really love us, or if we view them as things that we do because we really love God, but if other people don't do these things like uh, Bible reading or or corporate worship or fasting or various other spiritual practices, if other people don't do them, then we look down on them because they're not as spiritual as us. Paul, again, throughout the book of Colossians, it's all about the supremacy and the salvation and the amazingness of Christ that we don't add anything to our salvation. Now, we, how we live matters, of course, and so, but however, our motivation for how we live is not to gain something from God, but in response to what God has already done for us. And so, again, in verse 1, when he has, says, So, if you have been raised with Christ, seek, your high, uh, seek the things above. What he's talking about here is that being risen, because we have been risen in Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus, we do not struggle to attain uh, being God's people by right living. So, again, it's not Jesus plus do certain things, and the people who follow Jesus and do certain things, well, those are God's people, but the people who just believe in Jesus but don't act as good as others, well, they don't quite make the cut. They aren't actually part of God's family. That's what Paul is saying is that is not true, that we have been given access to God, that we have been invited into God's family because of what Christ has done for us, and now we must allow this status to be worked out in us. In other words, we see Christ, and we desire to live in a way worthy of His name set our minds on things above, or the things that he would have us want to pursue, not on earthly things. Again, the distinction is, we have already been given status and acceptance in Christ, and so we live in this reality. We don't live in a way in order to get it. And that changes the motivation, right? To Doing something in order to achieve something, or to win at something, versus already having won, and so just living out what you've already won, that's kind of a different motivation. And so what Paul is saying here is, because we are first saved... Now let's live in this reality. Let's live with the reality that God has loved us and given us grace and has brought us into his family. And so let's live in a way that is worthy of this this gift that God has given us. Not to earn it. We've already been given the gift. But now that we have it, let's live in a way that's worthy of it, of walking in what this, this forgiveness and this grace that he has given us. And so let's set our minds on the things that he would have for us instead of our own selfish uh, desires that can often put us above other people. And then he says this in verse 3. He says, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, this is the uh, the biblical concept of the already and not yet, that Christians, right, we belong in the new age that will ultimately be inaugurated when Christ returns a second time, a second time and reestablishes his rule and reign and recreates the heavens and the earth right? But this present age that we still live in is not over yet until Christ returns. And so we have tastes of God's kingdom that we're, if you're a follower of Jesus, we're supposed to be God's temple or God's presence or God's spirit in the world that we give people taste of the kingdom to become, and we love people, give people grace and forgiveness and mercy, but we're not there fully yet. We're not there fully yet. And so Christ, who is our life, when he appears, he's talking about when he returns a second time, then you will also appear with him in glory. So all of the uh, all followers of Christ, whether dead or alive at Christ's second coming, will appear with him in, in glory and will take part of this new creation. We, were di- we, were de- we died in Christ and will be risen with Christ as well. Uh, it's kind of like, you kind of, you kind of think of it this way, um, that uh, it's like when you're engaged, kind of this, this idea of like this already and not yet, maybe some, some ways that may, may, I think it's helpful. Like if you're engaged, right? When you propose marriage or when you're engaged, you have a fiance, you're not married yet, but you're going to be. And so you might do certain things, maybe not everything that you would do if you're married, but there are certain things that you do during the engagement to prepare for marriage, even though you're not married yet. And so you might start, you know, compiling your finances and bringing them together. Uh, you might start sharing, you know, a calendar so you know 
where each other is. You start making future decisions about where you're going to live, uh, wh wh what your job was going to look like, or what your weekly rhythm is going to look like. You're not married yet, but there are certain things that you are doing that are pointing you or preparing you for being married. Or uh, like a draft pick. If somebody's drafted in any sport that you might be a fan of, right? when they're drafted, even if they haven't signed the contract yet, or even if training camp or the preseason or practices haven't started yet, they're still on the team. And so they're still maybe learning the playbook. They're getting to know the, co the coaches, the trainers, the organization, the city that they're drafted in, even before a contract is signed. They're preparing for what is going to be their new reality. And that's what Paul is saying here, that our new reality isn't here yet, uh, but it will be when Christ returns. And so, verse 5, he says this, Therefore, because this is going to be the case, because we are going to be a part of this new kingdom, therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Again, Paul's point here is that if we are raised with Christ and His kingdom and His values and His virtue and His character, then we should put to, get to death whatever belongs to our earthly nature or our sinful or our selfish nature, or our nature that places us above other people, that tries to gain revenge if anyone ever wrongs us, that, again, doesn't lead us to treat people the way that Christ has treated us. Uh, that is what he is talking about here. So put to death, again, this is, a, this is strong language. It says not try your best not to do these things, but if you do, it's okay. Or, you know, try on most of the days not to do bad things. But if you live six days and you're pretty good, you can have one day to kind of do your own thing. Now, Paul says, put it to death. In other words, that you and I should take severe measures, if, if needed, to conquer some of the sinful natures and, and weaknesses that we have that, uh, that are our consistent struggle to us. In other words, this is a proactive stance, not a reactive stance. It's not a, hey, I blew it, so I'll try my best not to do it again. What this is is a proactive, here's what I will do to avoid it. So if sexual immorality, uh, lust, evil desire, greed, uh, whatever the issues might be for you, the question is not after it happens, hey, I'm just going to try to white knuckle it and do the best I can and hope it works out. No, it's going to be, hey, what do I need to proactively put in place? What boundaries, rhythms, accountability structures do I need to put in place to pro proactively put these things to death, not just hope that these things will work themselves out on their own. And so again, he gives specific examples. He talks about sexual morality or impurity or lust, right? Uh, for Paul, for biblically speaking, uh, any type of sexual relationship or sexual intercourse between non -married, uh, a non-married man and woman couple is sexual morality. So heter heterosexual uh, sex, you know, between a boyfriend and girlfriend or even a, an engaged couple, if you haven't actually made that commitment, this covenantal commitment that I'm going to lay down my life for you, that would be outside God's design for human flourishing, uh, homosexual relationships, uh, polyamorous relationships, anything outside the covenantal commitment of a man and a woman, biblically speaking, would be considered sexual immorality. This is pornography. This is one night stands. This is taking advantage of other people, any of these things. We need to proactively put these things to death, any sexual activity outside of marriage period. Now, again, how do we be proactive? In this specific example, well, there's lots of things you could do. Uh, you could have a software on your accountability software on your, on your devices that sends a weekly report to people uh, who, who can check, up in, check in on you and see how you're doing. It could be uh, meeting with somebody once a month or twice a month just to talk about life and to be intentional about these questions. Uh, there's lots of things we could do in various areas. The question, again, is not how to be reactive, but how to be proactive, because Paul says, put these things to death, and you don't put things to death on accident. It takes intentionality. He even talks about greed. Now, greed here can be not just necessarily money, but it, it could be defined as any unchecked hunger for physical pleasure, which, again, ultimately becomes idolatry, something that we want above God or above anything else. We're going to do whatever we want. We're greedy for it, and so we're idolizing these things. Right? It's about what you want, and, and it's about making you the center of, what you, of your world and not God and not loving other people. And so Paul wants us to put sin to death before it kills us, because ultimately either we put sin to death or sin puts us to, us to death, that it is a big deal. And so he says this in verse 6, in light of the sinful inclinations of our hearts and how we can live, it says this, verse 6, because of these, right, the things that Paul listed and other things, uh, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. 
In other words, for Paul and the New Testament writers all over Scripture, that God's wrath is a real thing. It is actually going to become, and it is actually going to be executed. Of course, Jesus himself will return to judge evil, of which all of us have taken part. Well, again, this is why his first coming makes so great, that, God, that Christ is going to judge all evil and all sin for what it is. Now, at the end of the day, I know in our culture today this makes us uncomfortable, but God's wrath is actually what makes him good. And if we choose chaos for our lives and going our own way, we see throughout Scripture that God won't stop us. Romans chapter 1 is an example of this, that God will give us over to our desires. And often, we often feel the effects of our sin even before others find out, right? Sometimes we find, we, we find ourselves doing things, even if other people don't know about it, we, we feel the effects of it and the, and the, and the uh, consequences of our sin. And so Paul's point is that God's wrath is real. And God will defeat wrath, which again points us to the amazingness of Christ, that he invites us in, that he does not, for for those of us that are in Christ, he doesn't say that our sins don't matter, but he takes the wrath of God himself on our behalf, because ultimately God will take, will get rid of it, either through us or through his accomplishment on the cross. And he's saying, hey, you choose. Do you want me to take it for you, or do you want to face the consequences of your sinful and evil decisions and desires. So again, verse 6, and then going to verse 7, he says this, because of, God, because of these, because of our sinful desires, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you, again, Colossians has talked to believers, and you once walked in these things when you were living in them. In other words, many of the believers in Colossae and us, those of us that are followers of Christ today, can relate to the difference in the pain we experience, right? If you follow Jesus later on in life, you can probably think of times before Jesus and times after Jesus and how Jesus has changed your life. Or uh, maybe you've always kind of grown up around the church and always been following Jesus, but you can see the older you got, as you grew more uh, mature and as you grew closer to Christ, you can see how Jesus has worked in and changed your life. Again, the reality is all of us are broken. All of us are messed up. And it's not about us doing things to save ourselves but it's about Christ saving ourself and experiencing his grace and through the power of his spirit, of his spirit, walking closely, more closely to him and putting away these evil desires and being proactive about him because they bring death and destruction to us and those around us. And so again, this is what Paul encourages us to do in verse eight. He says this, but now put away all of the following anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Again, put them away. Proactively kill them, not reactively hope that next time you'll do better. Proactively kill these things and put these things away. Now, again, these things are in verse 8 that we just read. Also in verse 5, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, idolatry. He's telling us to put these things away. Because why? The Christian life ought to be marked by love for others, right? Ultimately, what's the greatest command that Jesus says? Love God and love others. And these things that Paul is writing about here uh, restrict us from actually doing that. Sexual immorality, taking advantage of other people sexually, that doesn't promote love for others. Uh, Greed, our own selfish desires, slander, you know, gossip, anger, wrath, all of these things, taking revenge on people. Uh, None of these things promote loving people greater than ourselves. It promotes ourself and our amazingness and our putting, you know, taking God into our own hands or taking, being a judge into our own hands as opposed to trusting God and loving people. And so Christian life is supposed to be uh, marked by that. Uh, so for example, let me give you an example here. He says filthy language. Now, in our day and age, we, we might assume, well, he's just talking about cussing. Like, don't say bad words. Now, in this context, maybe, you know, if our culture has defined certain things as, um, I don't know, not the best speech, then maybe because of the culture in which we live, we should, you know, uh, live in our culture and our context and abide by those things and refrain from maybe using poor church choices of words. But in Paul's mind, it's not just about cussing. Filthy language can be anything that is not determined by true or f- false, or about what, or let me put it this way. Uh, filthy language uh, is not just determined by saying something that is true or something that is false, but whether it helps or harms another person. Right? There are many times in your life or in my life where we say something that is factually true, but we say it in a way or with the intent to hurt somebody, not with love or with grace, but to call someone out, uh, to mock somebody, to make somebody feel bad. That you can say factually true things, but if our heart for saying these things is to tear down someone else, well, this is also unhelpful and filthy language in Paul's mind. Again, followers of Jesus should be marked by love for others, and these things prohibit us from doing that. 
And so he says this in verse 9. He says, do not lie. He gives, an, he gives some more examples. He says, do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. So don't do these things. Why? Because you have put away your way and your way of living and your desires for God's way and God's way of living and God's desires. In other words, for Paul, sin matters not just because it is bad, but because it kills us. It ultimately will kill us and separate us from God. It's not just that it's bad, but that it separates us from who he is. And for Paul, life is found in Christ and being renewed by him is an ongoing process. And so it is helpful to have spiritual practices and disciplines to help us grow closer to Christ. Again, not so we can check it off a box and make ourselves feel better, but that's so we can experience more of who he is and more of his spirit so that we can better uh, love people and love him the way he has asked us to do. And then finally, verse 11, he says this, in Christ, again, this all goes back to Jesus, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free, but Christ is all and in all. In other words, in Christ, there is no distinction in status, ethnically, gender, socioeconomic status. In, in terms of who can experience the grace and mercy of God, <laughs> there is no distinction. And so Paul here is giving different types of people um, that in their day they, they, they would have divided people by. Maybe in our context today, you can think of, you might say, men and women, black and white. Uh, maybe the, if the country that you're living in and the other countries around you, he might divide it up by countries. Uh, what he's ultimately saying here is, is not, what he's not saying is that our differences go away or that they cease to exist. Like our differences are there, the color of our skin, our gender, um, our nationality, our, our language. I mean, these things are there. It's not that they cease to exist. But for Paul, they are irrelevant to the question of who we should love, honor, respect, and forgive. None of these things should stop us from loving people the way God has loved us and has asked us to love others. There is no category of person that does not deserve Christ's love. And in our culture, our, the human tendency is to kind of divide people up. These people we like and these people we don't like, and we make massive overgeneralizations in order to make ourselves feel better for judging people the way that we do. Paul is saying is, do not do that. There is no distinction between who deserves God's mercy and who doesn't. And so that being said, we'll wrap up with three main ideas from Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 11. The first one is this, seek Jesus. In other words, don't try to refrain from doing bad things and just try to stop in your own power and will not to do them. We're supposed to seek Jesus through the power of his spirit, have his spirit, reflect on the gospel, and ask us for, through his strength. To help, him love, to help us love people and love him better. You don't just do this by your own self-effort and will and determination, by following God and allow, allowing him to renew your mind. And so Paul's encouraging us here. Seek Jesus. Number two, he's encouraging us to turn from sin. Now, it's, again, it's important to get this order correct. It's not turn from sin and then seek Jesus. It's seek Jesus, experience his grace and his mercy, and then turn from sin. Why? Because the motivation is important. Because you have received grace and God's grace and mercy, that you and I should live in a way that allows other people to also experience his grace and mercy. So we seek Jesus first because he saves us, and then we live in a way that reflects this gift of grace that he has given us. We should turn from sin. And lastly, we need to remember that there is no hierarchy in the kingdom of God. There is no hierarchy. It doesn't matter your gender, your ethnicity, how much money you make, where you live, what you've done, what's been done to you. There is no hierarchy. There is no distinction between who deserves God, God's grace and who doesn't. We are all equal in the kingdom of God. And that's Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 11. Hey, thanks so much for checking out this video. We upload new videos every week to help encourage you in your faith in Jesus. So be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you'd never miss a thing.